Welcome to this edition of Artico. Let's get to it. In a world where just about everyone has a camera, we explore some of the philosophies and the journey of a modern day Baltimore photographer. Raised in, uh, let's see, born in Winchester, Virginia. Okay. All right, um, came to the DC market at a young age, probably second grade, first grade, some back there in Southeast DC, like everybody who migrates to DC from the country. Um, then uh, PG County, Howard County, educated in Howard County and upstate New York, you know, Rochester Institute of Technology. When did art kind of like got your eyes? I, I guess you can say the DC environment, because of the Smithsonian, um, there were free museums to go and visit all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that honed my desire to learn more about art, mm -hmm. um, to express myself in ways, you know, as a only child, so to speak, you know, I'm always into stuff and have a lot of energy. So I dived into the art world. I love to draw. I um, like, you know, graphite and paper and I'm gone, you know, that kind of thing. And then, of course, I would love looking at the master's paintings, sculptures, things of that nature. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, school field, field trips back to the Smithsonian. So it's art has always been a part of me. Oh, wow. And yeah. um, what was like the catalyst for that interest? Uh, vacation. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. We went to Hawaii. I uh, went to the islands. Um, and on the way there, a friend of mine said, hey, you know, you should take a, a camera because you're not going to be able to draw mm -hmm. um, everything that you're going to see in the time frame. Yeah. Take a camera, you can, you know, draw it later. Okay, cool. So I got the camera. It was a film camera, a little Infinity, uh, Infinity Zoom 220 or something like that. So uh, when I got the first roll of film back on the trip, um, I basically fell in love. Okay. Um, wow. instant, instant gratification. Yeah, really? you, know, you actually see, like, wow. You know, so it was a point and shoot. So I didn't really take any classes at that point. I just basically was introduced to it at, during okay. the trip. And, you know, so now you're, uh, your photography becomes a hobby. It's just something that you love to right, do. Right, right. Um, at what point did it become a it's a hobby now, but I have been doing this for a while. Now I realize I have an eye for it. And when can I turn this into a business? And what, when was that moment for oh, you? Oh, wow. Um, you're having me go back here, but I believe <laughs> I got serious with it um, through, I got married, I guess. You could say I got in a relationship and I wanted to do something um, creative. Mm -hmm. You know, we just bought a house and I decided to take classes at the local Howard Community College. Um, I had apparently a good eye for composition. Even though I didn't know anything about settings at the time, I had a good eye, and that's why I went, ended up going to school okay. to Somewhere. basically learn more about the different settings the camera had, especially film days. Yeah. Everything had to be meticulous, you know, otherwise you wasted a roll of film, which was a lot of money back then, you know. When you decide that you want to do anything, the quality of the equipment that you're working with mm. um, comes to play. Yeah. And then not only the you're doing it for fun, it's a hobby, oh yeah, I'll shoot you. Uh, your time away from the family, the time away from your anything else that you wanted to do, now you're shooting somebody and you realize, well, I'm doing this for free. Yeah. Um, they're gonna pay for the film, they're gonna pay for the development, but who's paying for my time for doing this? Yeah. All of a sudden, these things kick in, especially when you look at the quality of the work and you're looking at the lens that you use um, and it's a kit lens that was sold with the camera. Right. You know, people trying to sell a you know, product, they'll give you a kit lens, and the quality is not the greatest. It's yeah. not bad, but it's not the greatest. And you see results from great lenses and great camera systems, and all of a sudden you see how much they cost. And then all, you kind of like, okay, well, let me put a, a number to this, an yeah. hourly number, so I can at least have some money to buy the next lens or the next camera system yeah. that I want to do. So that literally 
hit me over the head one day when I was sitting there digging in my own pocket from my nine to five job and mm. trying to put money on the table to buy a new lens to go shoot somebody for free. <laughs> yeah, it hit that's me. Not it. That's not it. That's not it. So, you know, the, uh, um, when it comes to entrepreneurship, um, uh -huh. a lot of times they say use your nine to five to fund your dream. Mm. And from what I'm getting, that's that's what you did early on is oh, yeah. use your nine to five. So how was that balance? And by, are you full-time photographer? Or are you, you know? I don't think I, I've been a full-time photographer in between jobs, let's put it like that, okay. you know? Um, I've always had an interest in my day job, you know, things that I did, because both of them were like passions of mine. I guess the, the transition or the, um, the balance started one year when I ended up, I was working for the Washington Post at the same time I was learning photography, mm -hmm. and I'm watching some of the great photographers uh, uh, of the Post, like uh, Carol Guzzi. I'm looking at her work and I'm like, wow, I want to do that. I would love to be able to do that. But then again, as you deep, dive deeper into what photojournalistic is and where you end up and yeah. all the risk involved, I'm like, nah, maybe not. I think I'll stay <laughs> domestic and I'll stay safe in my own little hood, you know, even though it's dangerous, whatever, you know. But I think it was um, fast forward maybe eight, nine years, I decided to get my own studio. So I wanted to see how to set things up. So everything came to play. And yes, you end up taking some of that budgeting some of your money from yeah, your day job right. and say, okay, this is how much you got, or ta take a tax return, Yeah. all right, and then, okay, I got a lump sum here, and now I can actually, you know, put this towards, you know, shopping for a studio, things of that nature. All right, so you've been a photographer 30 plus years at this point. <laughs> um, it's been a while. Um, how has photography changed since when you first started to now, you know, and, um, you know? Yeah, so basically, um, you remember that the start was film. Yeah. And there was a lot of delay in production with film. So there was always a need to do things faster and here comes digital. And I just happened to be at RIT when the digital market uh, started coming on board. I was in RIT from 99 to 2004 in the summer times. And I remember when the professor broke out a digital camera and um, so he's talking about how it's gonna revolutionize, you know, the, the production of magazines and things of that nature. Um, but of course, you know, humans are humans. They wanna sell product. They spent money yeah. in the new digital photography where you can just literally get, you know, shoot and go. And that has changed the game where, um, as I always tell folks, you know, everyone's a photographer now. The camera in your hand uh, is actually everyone. a phone now. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so taking quick shots is, you know, they made it available to everyone. Now you, have to do certain things to, you know, keep your keep your dreams alive, keep your art up, uh, find your niche, and find your specialties and things like that. Most artists do that anyway. When I teach photography here, we always I call it uh, researching the masters. Yeah. So I'll go back to anywhere from Herb Ritz to um, Peter Limbaugh, um, Annie Leibovitz. Uh, Helmut Newton. I mean, there's a whole bunch of folks that uh, Henry Cartier, Brisson, I'm, he's my one of my favorites when it comes down to learning how to time things. If I got a white wall, that's a reflective. Yeah. So now, if I want to jump, I want to have a party scene or anything else, I'm good to go. Yeah. There is a difference, though. If you, if the outdoor light, like I was talking about being underneath the Whitehurst Freeway, it's a big soft box coming through. It's ambient light fueling everything. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful light. There's no, I, I, I can't, you can duplicate it in the studio, but I don't, I never felt as if I accomplished that. Yeah, um, the business of photography, um, as an entrepreneur, how do you keep your business going? Like, <laughs> you know, what are the challenges in the road, if you will? Uh, get knocked down seven, get up eight, <laughs> um, <laughs> really. I have learned that you always have, you got to have multiple oars in the water. And in my days of Brick City and RIT, um, in the dorm room, I said, you know, I would love to be, I, I'm not the greatest photographer, I just stay, like Einstein says, I, I, I'm not the smartest person, I just stay with the problem longer. Yeah. So I decided that I have to have multiple oars in the water. That means I love to shoot. Somebody always comes up to me and says, hey, can you teach me to shoot? photography workshops. Yeah. All right, as you do that for a while, you're thinking, okay, this guy's really good. I'd, I would like to have a platform where I can show other people his work. So I was like, let's do art shows. Art in the City is the name of my art show. I okay. do it annually. We have, a, we, at last we did a semi-annual um, magazine where we focus and let people read about the artist. Where they can find the workshops, all that good stuff, right? 
So all that took place. Um, so, and then my own photography, you know, weddings of course, headshots. I get a lot of uh, the res residents, so here at John Hopkins, we're leaving headshots. Mm -hmm. um, keep that going. Also, the space that you're in right now is rented out to other creatives. So you got people that are photographers, um, even yoga students, you know, yoga instructors looking for a space, things of that nature, so I rent the space. Yeah. Right? So that's four oars in the water to keep me going. Um, so business-wise, what's, you know, what's like your, what's next? You know, you know, what would you like to accomplish or where do you see your business going in five, ten years from now? I want to continue doing what I'm doing. I love teaching. I love getting questions like this um, and helping people define their direction. Yeah. Um, there, it's a different market now than when I started. It's a, it's a way, way more competitive. And after you hone your skills and actually understand how to make your vision come to life, a lot of artists have a hard time connecting with other folks. You know, you have to network, yeah. right? It's not about you being the greatest photographer. It's about, okay, that person over there, I connected with them. I like his work, I like his work, but I know this guy. Yeah. I'm gonna bring him in first, right? And yeah. that person, that might be the only thing he brings in because the person sold it on him, right? So there's a lot of things where I think people need to connect, do more networking, get seen, not just your work, but meet you, you know? Yeah. I think uh, that'll help a lot of folks, and that's where I would like to, you know, I, I got a lot of talented folks here, but sometimes I have to open them up. So, hey, guy, why don't you go over there and talk to that gentleman? Yeah. You know, see what he's about, you know, yada, yada, yada. And that's why we do a networking event here. Okay. Um, once a month, it's called First Fridays. Every Friday night from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. People come in, we meet, we greet. It's almost like a photo shoot party. Yeah, We got okay. four setups we that's got going dope, on. Man. That's dope. I get to meet a lot of people, makeup artists, hairstylists, different vendors. I even got a couple chefs in here and we end up using them, you know, things like that. So um, a lot of great, a lot of great work has been created off of these networking events and the, the workshops themselves. So that's another piece of the puzzle. As you're shooting, I want to make sure that that mix is there, there because we can all learn from each other's experiences. Yeah, and that's a lot true. of people, a lot of people don't take that, take advantage of it. I don't think. Man. Keeping a tradition alive is a subtle art done sometimes in quiet ways that seem odd to our fast-paced world. Let's explore the subtle art of crocheting. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Artico. I'm your host, Asia, as we continue our series of the art of crocheting. Joining us today is a DC native that's been quilting since the age of six. Please help me welcome Mr. Richard Atchison. Hi, Richard, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Good, good, so you have been actually crocheting since you've been six years old. Please walk us through that journey. Well, at the age of six years old, we were staying with my grandmother on Kenya Street in Northwest. And my grandmother, first of all, I would like to say, I am exceedingly blessed to have been born into the lineage of a multi-talented and well-educated family. I thank God for that. Amen. And uh, we were staying with my grandmother on Kenya Street, Northwest. Okay. And as usual, we as little kids be outside playing mm -hmm. and what have you. But when my grandmother wasn't at work, when she was at home, mm -hmm. I was, uh, wasn't worried about too much uh, playtime outside. I was always inside following my grandmother because <laughs> she was always doing something interesting. Right. If she wasn't downstairs in the kitchen baking cakes, mm -hmm. she'd be in her room uh, sewing okay. or doing something. And she had carpet on the floor, and when she was sew, she would occasionally drop a pen or needle. And she had a big uh, pickle jar full of all kind of buttons, and I was just fascinated by them. I'd sit down there and sort them out and count them. And my grandmother's name, bless her heart, she passed. Her name is Ruby Thompson, okay. but all her children and all of her grandchildren call her mother. Okay. So when she was sewing, I say, Mother, can you give me some scrap material so I can sew me something? And she would. And then one day I seen her uh, knitting, mm -hmm. and I tried that, but I, I, did, I don't have that kind of patience for a knit. <laughs> because it's, it's, you know, two or more needles. Okay. And then 
you have a lot of stitches on one needle and the other. And if those stitches fall off that needle, it may be impossible to pick up where it left off at. Okay, okay. But it's different with crocheting. It is, okay. And so I asked her one day, Mother, can you teach me how to crochet? Mm -hmm. And she began to teach me how to crochet. And the, um, the first thing I learned how to make was a granny square. It's like this here, this is a granny square right there. Okay. And I had made one about the size of a sheet of paper. And I was just so proud of myself. And so I was going to the school, Bruce Monroe, Okay. on Irving at the time. Uh -huh. And my grandmother and the lady that lived in the corner house, Miss Brown, I'll never forget her name. They used to go over there and teach classes, you know, crafts, uh, sewing and knitting and things. Okay. So my grandmother wasn't home at the time, so I ran up there to Miss Brown's house and showed it to her because I was so proud of myself, patting myself on the back. Right. And uh, she pulled it loose to the very last stitch. Did she? And I was so upset. Just unraveled it. Yes. <laughs> and I didn't say anything because I come up in the area you don't you don't question. Right. So after she pulled it out to the last stitch, she told me why. She said that I started it out the wrong way. Mm. And she said it wouldn't be no need to keep on going because it's not gonna end up right. Okay. And she showed me the right way to start it out. Mm -hmm. And I remembered but I never went back up there and showed her anything <laughs> else. <laughs> you I didn't want to play. With that, right? Yes, I remember. <laughs> and so, yeah, and then uh, the, that's the only thing I knew how to make for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I would see the like pattern books, and I open it up and I see they had a lot of numbers and parentheses and asterisks and all that. And just the pattern books that your grandmother had laying around. Yeah, I would see, but I didn't. I didn't know how to read one. Okay. And I knew if I could find out how to read one of those pattern books, I could be able to make something other than a granny square. Okay. And I remember one day asking my grandmother after I had been crocheting for a little while. I said, "Mother, I said, uh, who taught you how to crochet?" And she said, "Nobody." I said, "Nobody taught you how to crochet." I said, "How did you learn?" And she said, I, I saw a lady crocheting one day and I looked over her shoulder and that's how I learned. Wow. Yes, I have quite a... Can we call you? Can we... Do you have a website? You can call me and I will give you my email. Okay. On there. Yes, okay. I don't have a website yet. Okay. My sister, she was telling me, you should let me put your, um, your things on it, like a site. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I'm going to have to get me quite a few things accumulated first before you do that, because once you put it on the site, you're reaching out to a lot of people. Right, right. And I wouldn't want to everybody to call and say, okay, okay, I'll call you back when I'm able to start your project. You know? <laughs> The DMV poetry scene is one of the most active communities in recent years. In this segment, we sit with a poet making their mark in the dynamic art form. Hello, today we're joined by an incredible poet, uh, Zaina Azam. And I want to thank you for spending the day with us today just to kind of go over your work and everything that you're doing um, in the area. So I feel like before we kind of get into the work that you're doing, it's important that we talk about your, your background and who you are. I think, you know, our background influences who, who we are and the work that we end up doing. So tell us a little bit, of, a little bit about your background. Sure. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. It's really such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, my background is that my family is Palestinian. My parents became refugees in 1948 and fled, you know, they left everything behind. Um, and they first went to Syria, where I was actually born. Okay. But when I was very young, we moved to Lebanon, to Beirut. So I had my childhood in Beirut. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 10 years old, we came to the U.S. So I, the narrative of my family is refugees, my parents and their generation. And then for me, it's, it's immigrants, it's being an immigrant. And, uh, but all of that is just very figural in, in how, I, you know, how I've been brought up and how I look at the world. Okay, that's wonderful. So, um, so you're a poet. So at what point did 
poetry hit you and say, hey, I can write this, I can recite this. <laughs> um, you know, I want to make this a part of my life. It was kind of early on, I, well, in my teens, basically. Okay. I remember in my teens reading a lot of poetry, being really interested in that way of kind of distilling our feelings and our emotions into words on a page. Um, I would go to the library often and just get in that poetry aisle and just sit and pull out books and read them. So I think it was then that I started really developing an interest. Um, I wrote a little bit. Uh -huh. um, I did not major in English, you know, literature or anything like that. It was just, poetry has just been something that I've done all my life on the side. Um, but I'd say about, you know, 14, 15 years ago, I decided that I wanted to make it more of a priority in my life. So I okay. started writing more. I started sending my poems out for, to publications and having them, you know, literary journals yep. assess them and, and publish some of them. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of, so it's been with me really all my life. So how, is, how did your like early life, um, or your background, family history, how, how does that um, influence your work? I think, uh, you know, a lot of my poems are about my background, about my parents being refugees, mm -hmm. about my parents, you know, becoming older and, have, and keeping that refugee experience in their hearts and how it kind of aged with them. Yeah. Um, it's um, also about, a lot of my poems are about, you know, being in between cultures in between languages, in between, you know, home and we can say exile. Yeah. Um, so there's that in-betweenness and so that kind of is in my poetry. You know, of course, I also, and I also write about um, like social justice kinds of issues, yeah. cultural issues. Um, but I also, you know, I write about love, <laughs> about <laughs> loss, and all those sort of universal themes that people write about as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we have your book here, and you are an author, um, and I see that pieces from this book have been published so, um, by journals and such. So, can you tell us about the, the title of the book? What does that mean? And, um, you know. Yeah, so... Um, the book is called Baina Baina in Between, and there's actually a little bit of Arabic on the front, which mm -hmm. there are the two words Baina Baina. Uh, Baina is a preposition in Arabic. It means between, mm -hmm. and when you put two of them together, Baina Baina or Baina Bain, it uh, connotes in betweenness. It's like in betwixt and between. Okay. So it felt like the right kind of title for my book because a lot of the themes are about that in between this. Okay. Uh, would you like to share a piece, um, some of your work from your book? or? Sure, you know? I'd be happy to. Um, so of course being Palestinian is very much a political, you know, Everything about being Palestinian is political. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the whole issue of justice for Palestine. And so I grew up with politics all over, all the time, you know. And even as a child, I always heard political discussions in my house. Um, and this is, I think, where this poem came from. Okay. It's called Immigrant. I grew up eating cheese with bitter olives, sesame and thyme infused olive oil on warm bread. Names in my family all meant something, like lifelong challenges. Bahij, splendid. Fatih, victorious. Samih, forgiving. In my childhood books, words flowed from right to left. Direction didn't matter then. At 10, we traveled east to west against time. I gained seven hours of youth, lost my compass. In New York, no sea to swallow the sun each day. Foods were sweet in America. People spoke as fast as they walked. Everything was large, washing machines, supermarkets, even bananas and red grapes. 
We settled in this vast, cold place with neither boots nor a sense of how to be warm. Snowfalls were beautiful and cruel. The freezing air slapped our faces each morning. Inside, there was the smell of garlic and onions on the stove, loud talking on the phone with relatives overseas. My family inhaled and exhaled politics like cigarettes all the time. We blamed the British, the Americans, Arab leaders, Zionists, communists, or a history that was simply unkind. The TV in the background reported news in a language we spoke but did not really understand. All this over a good meal, always, as if the hunger was in our bellies and not in our hearts. Lena, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you for sitting down and sharing um, your art with us um, on the Artico. So. It's my pleasure, really. I'm delighted to have done so. Thank you for having me here and for your great questions and for your interest. Thank you very much. Yes, and we look forward to seeing your new book that's coming out. Um, thank you. Yes. Summer, you said. Yes. All right, thank you. Thanks. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. And until next time, always remember to follow your art. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.